All right, so this I think is Kingfisher, Oklahoma. It's my best guesstimate. <clears throat> I was thinking Hennessy, but I think Kingfisher comes first and then Hennessy. Yeah, so this is Kingfisher. Still on Highway 81. Nothing new here. We're going to be on Highway 81, clear up into Kansas, almost to Wichita. I think. Oh, they got a Brahms here. If you're ever in this part of the country and you want something really good, but you're not sure what you want, or if some of the people with you want ice cream, but you want something different, try Brahms because they've got really great ice cream. Their hamburgers are good. Everything that they make is really good, but they have something that nobody else has. They have fresh squeezed limeades, and those are to die for. And they have the sweetened variety and the unsweetened variety. You can add your own sweetener to. And they have cherry limeades and, and regular limeades, but they actually squeeze the limes. They are so nice. They've also got, I don't know, like a hundred different flavors of ice cream and they'll make you anything with ice cream. So, pretty good place to eat. I think they got salads and stuff too, seems like. They got a pretty good selection of stuff. But Brahms is kind of famous in Oklahoma because it's an Oklahoma company. They've got their own dairy farm. Um, they produce their own milk, their own ice cream, all of that. They do it all. But they are, there are some in, I think up in Kansas and some in Texas too. So they're not just strictly in Oklahoma. But they don't, there's not too many that are very far away from Oklahoma either. So, I think there might be one in Dalhart, Texas that I've stopped at. It's probably the farthest one away that I can think of. And then there are some down south of us in Texas too. And I think there are some in Kansas, but I'm not sure exactly where. But they're all over Oklahoma though. Just about any any good sized town will have a Brahms. I've got 1,999, or no, 100,099, 988 miles on this truck right now. So 12 more miles, and it's going to turn over to, it's going to roll over to 200,000 miles. Oh, well, that's a neat sculpture, neat statue. Very cool. Jesse Chisholm, Ambassador of the Plains. Uh, okay. This is all, 81 runs along the Chisholm Trail, the old Chisholm Trail route. It runs right by where we live. 
the old trail probably went right through across the road from us, I would say. And it runs right on up into Kansas. Up to Dodge City, I believe. I think that's where they used to go to the nearest railhead. <laughs> Do you see that dog in that truck? It's funny because that's what I had in mind for a dog and I ended up with Tuck. And Tuck is completely different, but he's supposed to be half blue healer, which is really kind of weird. Half blue and half red, but he looks all red to me. And I don't even know if the, the lady that we got him from was being straight up with, my, I would call him my son-in-law, but he's not technically, but my, my granddaughter's dad. Doesn't matter, I like him anyway, he's a great dog. It's not what I had in mind, but sometimes what you have in mind isn't what's best for you. And then you figure out, you know, something else is probably was better than that, better than your idea to begin with. banging sound is the brakes in this road where it's shoved itself up made terrible ridges it's like being on a washboard road but it's a concrete washboard is what it is it's every bit as miserable as a dirt washboard road it's just the washboards aren't quite that close together Every time I run this road, I swear I'm never going to do it again because it's so bad. When I turn around and do it again. <laughs> Go figure, huh? I think our next town will be Hennessy. And then Enid. So we're getting on up here. It's just a little slow going. Not all that slow though. We've only been on the road for an hour and 18 minutes. So we're making actually really good time. I don't know why I feel like it's being slow. No, that's not right either. An hour 18 plus 40 minutes, so an hour and 58. It's almost two hours. That makes more sense to me. That's more what it should be. So we've got another probably four or five hours to go. dealer. Lots of John Deere's. It's got a good variety of stuff there too. It's 
there's barely any wind today. It's a little, little bit of a breeze, but nothing. The flags are not blowing around. A lot of times in this part of the country, the flags will be flowing straight south or straight north, depending on what's blowing through. But today it's relatively calm, which is really nice. That's given me some really good fuel mileage, which I always appreciate. We've got a high pressure system in place and it's cold. It's 43 degrees out there. But it doesn't feel so bad because the sun's shining. You know, it makes a lot of difference. Ugh. Get back to some smoother road, maybe. If you ever wondered what Oklahoma looks like, we've run it from the south end almost all the way to the north end. We've got a little ways yet to go, but where we started at was basically 59 miles north of Texas <laughs> on Highway 81. amazing. I've never seen this truck get this kind of mileage yet, so I guess it's motor baby finally breaking in. It takes diesels a long time to actually settle into where they're going to run at, I think. This is the Cimarron River. Not a whole lot of water in it. A lot of sandy river bank. Man, I'd love to go down there and do some arrowhead hunting. I guess I could if I wanted to. Got work to do, kind of, sort of. I'm getting 22 miles to the gallon right now. I'm, I'm not, having a hard time believing this. You know, is this just a long downhill stretch? It may be. Because this truck run, normally runs around between 14 and 16 miles to the gallon on the highway at 60 to 65, not pulling any trailers, just, you know, the truck only. like this little Yeti cup I've got. Very fond of it. <clears throat> it actually does what it says it will do. It keeps my coffee hot for a long time. And it's the traveling version with the mug that with the mug lid that screws on and also has a kind of a locking tab to keep it from splashing out. It's just pretty much the best go cup I've ever had. And I've had a lot of go cups. So I'm actually really, really happy with this one. I'm not sure what little town this is. Dover, okay. 
I always forget this is even here until I'm in it. And then I'm like, oh, there's a town. So this is Dover, Oklahoma. Sorry, Dover. Kind of a picturesque little deal there, a little shed. It almost looks like an old smokehouse or something. So that makes me think something I'm going to do on this trip is after I deliver my trailer down at Willis. If I come back up through, well, wherever I come back up through, I'm going to be looking for barbecue places. I'm going to get some barbecue. I've had a yen for barbecue for a month now, and I haven't just, I just haven't stopped and gotten any. So, I may do that today somewhere on the way up, even though I've got food for tonight. And I had, had my egg bites for breakfast, or lunch anyway. I may stop and get some barbecue somewhere. If I see something that looks good, I don't know. Sundays may not be the best day to be looking for it. I think Fridays and Saturdays are probably better days. It's because a lot of people like to take Sunday off, you know, so they can go to church and have, have their family time too. And most of these little barbecue places are family owned outfits. They're not. I don't go to the big chain restaurants much, if ever, <laughs> rarely. I rarely go to restaurants to begin with, actually. Um, I don't consider Starbucks so much a restaurant, it's a drive through convenience is what it is, but they just happen to have something I can eat there. Uh, I've got a project I want to do this spring if I can get around to doing it and if I can get some help to get it done. We have a 30 foot travel trailer sitting out at the lake where I went this morning to, to dump the trash at. Um, we, have, we pay for trash pickup over there so I just haul my stuff over from the farm. That's part of the deal, part of owning that. We, we get charged for it whether we use it or not so we do use it. But that trailer's sitting back in there, it, it's got at least one flat tire on it. It's been sitting there for 10 years, or 12, 13 years, 14 years. It's been sitting there for a long time. And I need to get in there and get the tires all squared away on it. I need to pull them all off, go get new tires for it, and come back and put them on. And then pull it out of there and get it cleaned up and redo it a little bit and then get it sold because it's not doing us any good sitting there like it is. It's just sitting there falling apart basically. A little bit of TLC and a little bit of money in it and we could probably sell it for quite a bit of money because it is a nice trailer. It's a you know it's a 30 foot two bedroom one bath 
with a kitchen and a, a living room, dining room slide out. So it's, you know, perfectly livable for one or two people as a, a you know, reasonably priced place to live. And these days, as many people live in little RV parks full time, I'm sure we can get it sold. I just need to make it cute and freshen it up. It's just kind of tired. You know, we we did live in it for a long time, so I want to put down new flooring in it, pull all the carpeting out of it. That's pretty gross. You know, 10 years of, of living in something that size, you're going to wear out the carpeting, and we did. There's not that much carpet in it. There's a little bit in the front bedroom, a little bit under the couch area. But I want to pull all that out and just replace it with vinyl flooring, make it not, a lot easier to clean. You know, you can just sweep it out and not have to worry about having a vacuum or whatever. And it doesn't accumulate as much dirt. Carpets accumulate a lot of dirt. I don't know if you've ever pulled out old carpeting out of a house or a trailer or anything, but you get it out of there, you realize quickly how filthy it is in and under a carpet, even one that you've kept up and vacuumed well and, you know, cleaned occasionally and all. It just the nature of the beast. They just get filthy. So, I guess I don't have to slow down this much out here. I get going better. Um, so, I want to get that thing cleaned up and ready to sell and just get rid of it because I just paid the insurance on it this year. It jumped up um, from 550 for the year to 719 so I'm not going to continue insuring it after this year but we we talked about it and I was debating not insuring it this year at all and just you know and Bill said you know if you do that our luck a tornado will come through and blow a tree over on it and we'll be out of luck and I'm like yeah you're probably right so we decided to do it one more year, and in that year, we have to get this thing, um, get it fixed up, freshened up, and sold. So this is Hennessy, Oklahoma, southern edge of Hennessy. So that's a project I want to do this year, and hopefully, because I've cut down on my working, I'll have time to do it this year. Because this is something I can do if I... I don't even know if I can get it up the driveway, um, but I can park it at my sister-in-law's, maybe, if I ask her nice, and work on it over there, which would be a lot more convenient than where it's at now. Um, it'd be a lot closer to where we are. And I'd be able to get in there and work on it when it, you know, when I have something going on and when I don't, then I can lock it up and leave it. But I'll get it out of the lake. And I, we need to finish cleaning out the lake and get that place up for sale again. But I don't know if we're ever going to get it sold because we never have finished it. We, we rebuilt all the floors and a lot of the framework in it because it had termites really bad. We didn't know that when we bought it. We actually had it inspected for termites and the termite inspector signed off on it and said there weren't any, but there were. <laughs> there was a lot of termite damage to it. So we had to repair all that, and um, we changed the layout, changed the floor plan in it, and added plumbing for for a, a bigger bathroom, and got the plumbing roughed in for the, the new, new location of the kitchen, because it was really, there was really nothing there. It was just two big rooms and, and one tiny little, or two tiny little bathrooms that were defunct. I mean, they were, you couldn't even use them. They were bad. So we basically gutted it and started over, but we just never finished it up between Bill working, you know, running his business and then getting sick. It was just kind of never happened. I mean, so at some point we're going to have to either hire somebody to go in and finish that, which there's not that much left to do. So I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards that concept um, because I really don't want to put pressure on Bill. Uh, the last thing I want to do these days is put any pressure on Bill. He's got enough stuff to deal with just with this, you know, sickness he's got. He doesn't need me <laughs> assigning him jobs. So, 
the, in, in my opinion, the stuff he wants to do that he does, that's great. And if he doesn't want to do something, that's great. I don't care. You know, it's, I just want him to be around. I just want him to be, you know, healthy and, and do well. So I'm going to probably end up, um, he's got a couple of guys he knows that we can probably hire to go in there and, and do some of the stuff. And he can kind of direct them, you know, he can boss them. And, and get it done the way he wants it. That's probably what we'll end up doing. But it would be nice if we could get that sold. If we could sell the lake house, we could pay off the farm. Because we don't owe very much. We don't owe much money on anything. We owe a little bit on the farm. That's it. And that's because every time we've had any kind of cash windfall or whatever, we, we paid off whatever we had a loan on. We did that with all the vehicles, and anything we had a loan on has been paid off except for just the house. And the lake house, we never did have a loan on because we bought that out of my, what little bit of retirement money I had. Um, that's where my retirement money went, was into that property. So it's about time to get it back out of there. And and pay this house off and then we can then we can live on next to nothing so that's the goal but I need to get that travel trailer out and get it fixed up and sold because it's an asset that's just sitting there losing value you know I can bump the value back up on it by fixing it up prettying it up and getting it on the market you know if I just get it done pretty quick um, It'd be worth, I don't know, eight or ten thousand dollars probably once it's fixed up. So that'd be all right. That'd be a nice way to end that whole chapter. Because we lived in that relatively inexpensively for a long time. I mean, I did have a loan on it, and my payment on it was like 249 bucks a month. But it was for 15 years. Well, it's paid off now. It's been paid off for a while. So we had a little bit more um, a little bit more flexibility once we got that paid off. But it was never like something that I had had to struggle to pay either way. So that was good, but it served its purpose. I'm not going to realistically pull a 30-foot trailer for recreation. I pull 30-foot trailers for work, <laughs> and I don't want to pull a 30-foot trailer for recreation. And we've got the little Shasta, which is a 19-foot trailer, and I love that thing. It's so easy to pull. Um, I've pulled it in the snow, up and down mountain passes. It's just simple. It's lightweight. Well, it's not so much lightweight, but it's a heavy trailer, but it's not like pulling a 30-foot trailer. Um, yeah, it's not as light as some of the newer, more modern ones are, but it's more substantial, too. It's built of wood instead of being built of styrofoam, which is that, that's what new trailers are actually built of. Little thin, funky wood strips or metal strips, and then um, insulation and a skin. So there's really not much to them. If you ever see one wrecked, you'll see what I mean. Keep your eyes open um, like when you're out on the highway. If you ever see a trailer that's been rolled, it's like it splits open and it's just that hard styrofoam inside. <laughs> they're, they're not very substantial. But this one, the Shasta, is actually wood and, and aluminum siding. So, you know, it's pretty solid. Would I trust it in bear country to keep a bear out? Hell no. But, you know, I'd rather be in it than a tent in bear country, I can tell you that. As long as I had like a bazooka-sized firearm of some type, some kind of a bear, a bear qualified caliber. <laughs> I don't know how big that would be. Here I go with my bear phobia again. I actually have a bear phobia. Not really a phobia. I'm, I'm legitimately scared of freaking bears. 
because I know what they can do to a human body and I don't want to have no parts of that none I do not want to end up being you know some bears snack du jour thank you very much uh -uh. don't think so so that's kind of my my um, yardstick for things I will and will not camp in and this is coming from a girl I used to backpack up into the mountains in Colorado and sleep in a little pup tent I mean you know but you get older and you get wiser and you get slower <laughs> <laughs> and, and then again the bears have, have moved back into a lot of the territory that they didn't inhabit back when I was doing all that backpack and now that's all bear country up in there granted they're not grizzly bears but you know brown bears and black bears kill as many people as grizzlies do there are more of them and people have more contact with them I don't think they're just running around on a rampage looking for people to kill, but hey, you know, shit happens. So, I don't want it happening to me. <laughs> I know. I know, I know. <clears throat> well, we're getting into northern Oklahoma now. We've kind of crossed out of central into north. And we've got about, I don't know, 50 more miles of Oklahoma maybe, if that, 40 maybe. It says Enid's 14 miles, so I'm gonna say we got maybe 35 or 40 miles of Oklahoma left. Which is fine. We're we're making just decent time. Just fine. I figured it would take six to seven hours to get up here, just poking along and seeing the scenery and not hurrying. If I was concerned about time, I would have gone right up I-35 and it would have been a five and a half hour trip. So, you know, if I didn't stop anywhere. But I like to stop occasionally, you know, stretch my legs, get out, get something to drink, take a little break. When I'm not in a hurry, if I'm in a hurry, I will sit in the truck and just drive all day and just do minimal stopping when I'm absolutely, when I absolutely have to stop for fuel or to make a potty break or whatever. But when I'm driving like this, I'll, I'll do whatever hits my fancy. You know, if I want to stop someplace, I'll stop. Whatever. Take a little detour and go see a site. Sundance Scout Camp, huh? I'm gonna guess that that's probably not operational anymore because their sign is about falling down. barn coming up. Kind of a neat looking farm actually, the whole thing. You can tell that's been there a while. It's not like they built that last week. Nice looking place.
other guy does the same thing I do. I use my zero turn mower for a lot of stuff. I'm always pulling something around or pushing something with it. I need to move stuff in the yard to mow around it. Sometimes I'll just push it over, you know, scoot it. You can do that. They actually make really handy tools for that kind of thing. Dragging tree limbs. I've dragged a lot of tree limbs with my zero turn mower. I didn't even mow last year. I keep calling it my mower, but now it's Bill's mower, I guess. Because he mowed, well, I think I mowed maybe once or twice. I was gone all the time. So maybe I'll do more, more mowing this year. Bill would like that because I don't think he likes to mow. <laughs> I actually enjoy it, but I don't think he does. But it's getting about time I need to mow out on the east end of the house. We've got a bunch of actual grass and clover out there that's not Bermuda. It's a different variety of grass. And it's already looking pretty thick and like it needs a cut. So I'm probably next weekend I'll probably get out and mow if it's not cold. It's just been too cold to do anything outside lately. That cold wind. I don't like being out in it. I've, I'm done with cold. I don't tolerate it well at all. Which is kind of weird because I used to. I mean, I worked out in serious cold for, I don't know, 30 years doing surveying and coughing, <laughs> policing. Got three old rugs sitting over here side by side. Turn this far enough so you can see it, I hope. I think that's in a yard. Those are stacked out, I guess. Once upon a time, you could tell which rig belonged to what company because they, had, they all companies had their own colors. Like neighbors had their colors and the other companies had their colors. And you could see them from a long way off. You could tell whose rig they were. I imagine they probably still do some of that, but I don't know. Maybe that hasn't changed. Maybe what's changed is me paying attention to it. <laughs> so I couldn't tell you if they still do that or not. Not really. Of course, I don't have much to do with the oil field anymore either. That's a neat old house. Old farmhouse has been bricked over and added on to. I mean, even when I was doing hot shot work, I very rarely went actually to the rig. My customers were more, they, they were always in an all fired hurry, but it was more from their factory to a powder coater or some other specialty finish outfit or to have some other component added to whatever it was that they were having me haul, whatever oil, oil filled component they were having me do. So I didn't do much out to the rig type stuff. A couple times, but Mostly when it, when it was something that went out to the rig, it was usually a pump, like a big water pump, or light trees, or things like that. Because I didn't really deal in pipe, like I didn't haul loads of oil field pipe. That's something I was never really interested in doing and tried to stay away from. I hauled a few pipe loads, but not like a full trailer full of drilling pipe. 
I had I had whole like little odds and ends of specialty size pipes they needed at this factory or that factory or wherever. But not so much the to the oil rig stuff, so And these days I don't care. I don't I have no intention to ever go back and do hot shot deliveries again. I just don't really care that much. I mean, now, today, um, the trailer industry is paying a lot better, a lot steadier than anything I did, you know, 15 years ago, hot shotting. I, I made more, more money per mile hot shotting at the time, but I was always in a hurry, so I was always running top speeds burning a lot of diesel my expenses were very high as I was constantly you know back and forth motels that all, all that and you know I was always just in a hurry and I was going into metro areas that I didn't really want to be in like Houston Chicago Dallas you know getting right in the, the these metro areas to some of these specialty builders and specialty finish people and all so I just you know I'm over that I don't want to do that and now um, the money that I'm making hauling trailers is steadier and my expenses are lower so you know I'm not hauling a 40-foot trailer behind me everywhere I go um, burning all that extra fuel constantly So I'm really happy doing the trailers, and it's no stress. I mean, relatively no stress. Every once in a while I get a little stressed. If I've got a store I know it's closing and I'm trying to get there before they do, kind of like last week. But for the most part, they're, they're usually really cooperative and accommodating when they don't really have to be. It's nice of them to do that. To like you know have somebody wait on me 10 minutes or I had one down in um, oh gosh Rose City Texas I think they sat and waited on me for 30 or 45 minutes one night the guy just pulled out a lawn chair or, or no it wasn't a lawn chair it was a golf cart <laughs> yeah, got to think about what I'm remembering here and he pulled out a golf cart and was sitting on it waiting for me in the yard when I pulled in with a trailer I was delivering and you know they made a point of keeping him there telling him you stay till she gets here so that was awesome it's wonderful when they do that because it saves me from having to get a motel in, in a big expensive metro area if i have to get motels i'd rather do it in small towns where the the cost is much less and the accommodations are usually much better usually cleaner <clears throat> safer you know so which is why I'm headed to Abilene tonight up to Abilene Kansas because I scoped out a motel there that's the only reason I'm going to Abilene because it's still Abilene is still about 50 miles away from where I'm going to pick up that trailer in the morning but that was as close as I could get and get a decent you know decently inexpensive and clean motel room so yeah it's kind of how it is <laughs> so I already knew that, that I didn't want to stay in Manhattan because I tried that the first time I went up there and that turned out to be a big bust because Manhattan is a, a college town so of course, the first time I was up there, they were having some big game, so all the motels were full. And I had to go to a town that was like 25 miles east of there to get a room. And that was still expensive. It was still almost $100. So I wanted to try something different this time. I'm going to stop up here someplace and take a little break. <clears throat> <coughs> This is Enid, Oklahoma. This is the last big, biggish town that we'll go through today in Oklahoma. Everything else outside here is going to be pretty small.
and I've still got just under three quarters of a tank of fuel. So I'm going to hold off and buy fuel up in Kansas somewhere, I guess. Hopefully I'll see it someplace really good and cheap. We'll see. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. It's kind of a crapshoot. But if I buy fuel now, I'm going to have to buy fuel again tomorrow. If I wait and buy it later today, um, closer to where I'm picking up, then I won't have to stop buy fuel on the way in to pick up that trailer. Anymore. I can just go on in and get it. So that's kind of the idea. Walgreens and CVS right across the street from each other. Isn't it funny how they do that? I, mean, I actually use Walgreens. I tried CVS, but I don't know. They aggravated me more than Walgreens. <laughs> So I just went with Walgreens. We started out using Walmart, but that Walmart that we go to is so damn busy that you have to stand in line for an hour just to do anything, to turn in a prescription or to pick up a prescription or whatever. I mean, you just hurry up and wait. At least with the Walgreens, you can just drive up and, you know, if it's prearranged and you know it's ready, you can just drive up and get it. You don't have to do that standing in line forever nonsense. Technically, I shouldn't have any trouble finding a motel tonight, but I'm getting to be really super finicky about where I stay. Used to be I didn't care as much, and if I get in a bind out on the road, I don't care. I'll just stay wherever I can stay, but when I can be finicky about it, I sure am. <laughs> Extremely. Okay, so this viaduct takes us over the railroad tracks. Got several sets of tracks down there. It's like a pretty good train yard. Just kind of looking for a truck stop. I think there's one up here on the north end of town somewhere. Got the afternoon yawns now. It's just now turning two o'clock. And my truck has officially turned 200,000 miles. 200,027. I wasn't paying attention when it turned. Making my notes. I thought there was a Brahms up in here somewhere. I think I'll circumvent that though. I don't need to really stop at Brahms right now. If I did, the only thing I'd be getting would be a, a limeade. Because I'm still full from eating before. Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> oh, just laughing at a business sign. It's a nail salon. It's natural nails, which salon nails are anything but, usually. They're not natural. That's kind of a big thing in in our culture now, I guess, is having sharp, pointy-looking fingernails. Have you noticed that? Like, when I was in my 30s, I guess, they started doing kind of the square tip, you know, where they're just filed straight across. And now they're doing the pointy, what I would kind of call like witch fingernails, <laughs> just because sounds better than just saying pointy but I guess that's what's in style now I don't find those attractive personally I think they're I don't know they look freaking dangerous to me I'm kind of glad that wasn't a thing when I was a cop I'm sure I'd have scratches on me I'm trying to think back to any like serious tussles I had with women. A couple of times I had wrestle women. Had to hog tie one once. Well, we didn't call it hog tying, but that's pretty much what it was. To get her in into the jail. <laughs> She's a little fighter. But I only ever had one person take a swing at me the whole time I was a cop. So I must have been doing something right. At least I wasn't, like, encouraging people to try and punch me because, you know, I couldn't control my mouth or whatever. But it was kind of funny because the person that took a swing at me was a little bitty skinny drunk lady. She was one of our chronic drunks in town. Then we had... The, the town I worked in was about, I don't know, eight or 10,000 people, somewhere along there. And we had like probably a dozen people on our frequent flyer drunk and druggy list. People that we kind of watched out for because in that climate, you know, we had snow for six months out of the year pretty much on the ground, five or six months. And it got damn cold, you know, 50 degrees below. And so we kind of, especially the night people, night crew people, we kept them an eye out for our drunks and our, our druggies that we knew were homeless or whatever, or that we knew were apt to be out wandering around and falling down in snow banks. So I fished her out of a snow bank one night. She was pretty drunk, but this was her typical, she, she was always pretty drunk. And um, I dealt with her, I don't know how many, dozens of times probably. So I took her into the jail um, to detox. So it, we had a really good um, code on the books where if somebody was in drunk public and they didn't have somebody sober who was willing to take them and be responsible for them until they sobered up, we could take them into the jail and put them in a detox cell and give them a sandwich and let them sleep it off. You know, and then they would go, once they blew um, low zeros, whatever the minimum was, and um, they weren't drunk anymore, then they could be released without any charges. Which is, it was, I thought it was a, like a really good option to have with some of these people because otherwise, um, a lot of them would have just laid on the street and froze to death. I mean, to be really blunt about it, because nobody gave a shit. Um, Aside from the few cops that were out around keeping an eye on them, whether these people lived or died, you know. Except maybe their other drunk friends, but, you know, they weren't actually out there helping them. So, anyway, one night I picked her up and took her in for detox, and she was wearing this great big puffy parka coat. And, of course, when you take somebody in for detox, you still search them because you can't have them introducing contraband into the jail even if they're just there temporarily to sober up. So, um, you know, you, you confiscate whatever they've got on them that might be contraband. And I pulled a little bottle of vodka out of her coat pocket. And I was like, okay, that cannot go in with you. Yeah, set it up to the side, you know, put it in the, we had little tubs, we put, you know, stuff in. 
and we I wasn't going to give it back to her because she was on the don't, do not sell to list anyway for alcohol so she wasn't supposed to have it and I'm sure she had a restraining order not to be drinking because most of them did um, so I went ahead and confiscated that and she got mad <laughs> I mean she came up maybe halfway up my my arm um, in height she wasn't she was nowhere near my shoulder in height she was a little bitty and you know she was just skin and bones she was just a little old drunk lady but she got mad and she took a swing at me <laughs> I was like whoa you know caught her hand like simmer down you know better than that and she's like oh no so she sat back down and cooperated the rest of the time but man if she could have she would have cleaned my clock she was mad I took her booze so but in all the years that I did that job, she was the only person who actually tried to take a full swing at me. And I had other people push and shove and grab my shirt or, you know, stuff like that. But never had anybody else. <laughs> it was, it was kind of comical. Yeah, it was, it's kind of sad funny. It's one of those sad funny things. I'm pretty sure she's long since dead. And the guy that she used to run with, he walked around town with a, a big walking stick. I pulled him out of I don't know how many snow banks. He just walked till he fell over and then, you know, we'd come along, scoop him up and take him for detox, get him warmed up. Uh, you know, sobered up, warmed up, and get him back out. But, you know, not much of a life, really. That's not... But I felt good about that part of the job because I really was out there watching out for them. And I was like the drunk whisperer, I guess. Usually when we had drunks on the road, the guys couldn't talk into the, into the back of their car to take the detox. They'd call me to come talk them in. <laughs> so I, would, I would. I'd just go talk to them and I'd get them to sit in my car and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to take you in. You're going to have a place to stay tonight and see if we can get you a sandwich. They'd be like, okay, let's go. Like okay, let's do. But, you know that people don't understand what cops have to deal with, and a lot of what they deal with is the stuff that society has decided they're they've washed their hands of, like mental illness. Um, let me go ahead and restart this here, so I mark this, since I'm going to talk about this topic. Um, back in the was it in the 90s? They pretty much closed down the last of the insane asylums in the United States. There are still some private mental hospitals, but they're not long-term usually. Uh, most of them aren't long-term, except in the case of court-ordered detentions. So people that once were housed in insane asylums, and I, I don't know what else to call them, that's what they were called, so don't scold me for being politically incorrect. You know, do that and you can kiss my ass anyway, but <laughs> if you're a politically correct, if you're worried about that kind of shit, then we're not going to get along very well anyway. But So they, they closed down the insane asylums, so all the people that had been in asylums and had been monitored, medicated, and taken care of, and fed, and sheltered, all of a sudden ended up on our streets and that's where they remain to this day and my brother Wes was just talking about his trip to Washington DC last year where he had a close encounter of the nutty kind with a mentally ill woman and she was following him around yelling shit at him and basically you know this is what a lot of mentally ill people do and because there are no longer places to put these people to take care of them and keep them out of trouble, cops on the street are usually the guys who are going to be dealing with them on the front lines. And I dealt with a lot of them. <laughs> a lot of them. Trust me when I tell you that. Ah, shooting day. That's interesting. Shoot and skeet out over a field with cows in it that doesn't look too smart just saying hmm I don't know about that 
anyway, so I dealt with a lot of mentally ill people, a lot. In fact, about, I would say 50 to 60% of my customers were mentally ill. I call them customers, kind of in, you know, tongue in cheek. But you know, if you, you have people running amok on the streets with these severe mental illnesses, severe mental issues, and then you throw a little bit of booze or dope into the mix, which almost all of them will try anything they can to get some relief from their demons. And so they will get into the drinking and the drugging, thinking that it's going to make them better. Uh, you know, they're self-medicating. I think that's what they call it now, isn't it? Self-medicating. So, who ends up dealing with these people? Well, cops do. So, if you're thinking about being a cop, <laughs> think about how you talk to people. And how you would talk to somebody you know is freaking crazy. And I'm talking crazy as a bed bug. Totally not. And they have some weird idea in their head that's totally untrue, but they believe it 100%. And nobody else believes it and they're they're trying to convince everybody that you know somebody's out to get them or whatever it is whatever delusional thing is in their head you know it's freaking them out so they're acting out against that and then they run up against you you know guy or gal with a badge and now it's your problem you've got to deal with this person think about how you're going to talk to people so <laughs> um I had, I'll tell you about my craziest day on the job when I dealt with the most crazies ever. And it, it, it was two crazy people. That was the most for one day. But I had like a lot of contact with both of them throughout the day. So I went to work one day and I was actually on the day shift for a change. I like mostly work nights, but every like twice a year or something I had to work at least a month of day shifts I don't know why because they wanted to torture me I liked working nights so I was being tortured on day shift anyway so I go into work and we get this call that a guy named Albert had wigged out and he was threatening to use a bow and arrow and shoot any cops that showed up at his house <laughs> I'm thinking okay maybe we just shouldn't go to his house but that's not an option so we all had to go to his house right I was like, he might as well just called up and said, come to my house, party's at my house, and I'm going to shoot you when you get here. It's pretty much what he said. So he was running around his neighborhood, evidently with his bow and arrow. And a bow and arrow is no fucking joke because you can be shot through a ballistic vest with a bow and arrow that a bullet won't penetrate, but a bow and arrow, an arrow point will. Um, so it's no joke. It's not something that, you know, anybody wants to have happen. So we all go up, uh, on north side towns where he's at, so we all go up there and we're all looking for Albert. And he's, turns out he's, he's barricaded himself in his house. It's like, oh great, here we go. Now we got to get the cert team out and all this shit. If we can't talk him out. And I don't remember exactly how we ended up getting him out. I've slept a few times since this happened. But at some point, I think he just came out. I think he gave up and came out. And we confiscated his bow and arrow, booked him into evidence for safekeeping until he regained his sanity. And we took him over to the jail and got him booked in. Well, he decided once he was in the jail, he didn't really fight us. We, we took him in, got him booked in, got him in the booking cell and all that. So, and it, by then it was afternoon and I got called over to take another crazy person from Craig down to Pueblo. And one of the things we did after hours extra work was transport people um, either going to mental places or whatever. So it was a good overtime deal. So me and this, this other cop were gonna go together. One of the guys I worked with a lot, Alvin, and he was really funny because he kept me out of trouble. He could tell when I was getting pissed and he'd step in and 
and tell me to go cool off and he'd handle whatever it was that pissed me off and then I would return the favor for him. <laughs> so we worked really well together. So we were going to take this crazy lady to Pueblo and it was in the winter and it's a snowstorm and or there was snow on the ground seems like I don't remember all the details but we're going to take her over to Pueblo. It's like five six hour drive. So I'm like well we'll take my car because I had a good cage and everything. He's like, okay, great. And he's like, he can drive anyway. I don't want to drive. I'm like, I want to drive. So good. We're in agreement. I'm in charge. So he's laughing, you know. So we get this crazy lady. We have to go get her at the jail. So I, we go to the jail. We pull my car into the Sally Port, which is basically a garage that's attached to the jail. And then we lock up our guns. And then we go in and we go get this lady. So we're or we were going to do all that. So we get to the Sally Port to pull in, and we still have to go in and lock up our guns. But we can't come in. We're like, we need to get in the Sally Port. And they're like, you can't come in. We're like, well, why? And they go, because Albert's in the Sally Port. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so the crazy guy we picked up earlier that day was sitting in the Sally Port in a combat chair with a spit hood over his head. Evidently, he was giving them trouble. <laughs> inside the jail and so we we get out we go walking in the man door into the sally port go lock up our guns and we're walking over and and uh so albert starts making comments to me sexual comments and me and alvin are looking at each other and kind of laughing it's like oh boy here we go so we go ahead and we we go on in the in the jail and so we get in there and we're like what is albert doing sitting out there and they're like, oh, he kind of nutted up in the holding cell and decided he was going to poop all over the cell and he smeared it all over the, the walls and all over the window on the cell so we couldn't see him. So we had to remove him and clean him up. So we took him out there and hosed him down <laughs> and had to put a spit on him because then he was spitting on everybody. And he wanted to fight, so they had to put him in a combat chair. So that's how Albert got out there. So, so Alvin just was making fun of me because you know hey you know Albert likes you he's the one that you know <laughs> I was like shut up don't even talk about it it was you know it was one of those things horrible it's like oh god gross gross me out so we go get this woman who was we had never dealt with her before she was just somebody somebody else brought in who was crazy and she had gotten a bed down in Pueblo so we had to haul her down there for her mental health um, stay at the state hospital in Pueblo. So we get her and we walk her out and walk her through the cell port. Of course, Albert's still sitting out there, still making comments. We're like, oh my God, okay, well, let's go out and get this lady in the car. So we put her in the back seat of the car. And when I transported people, um, if they weren't giving me any trouble, I would move their handcuffs around to the front. They had to be cuffed in the back seat. There was no option. We did not uncuff people in a cop car. So it's a good way to get killed. Um, but we would move their cuffs around to the front and put a seat belt on them. And, you know, as long as they behave themselves, they could ride like that the whole way. If they didn't behave themselves, and we would put their hands back behind them and belt them in. And if that didn't work, we'd lay them down in the seat. So and some people like to kick windows and stuff and they'd fight well she wasn't doing any of that she was be behaving herself pretty well so we we get going over there and we were somewhere south of Kremlin um, and we're, we're going down this road and there's a bunch of deer and there's a dead deer in the road and I just barely missed it and you know we, we kind of skimmed right over it and got out of the danger zone more or less and uh, and I hear her talking in the back seat. Well, my car had a, a metal cage with plexiglass sliders in it so that, you know, if somebody's in the back and they're being quiet, I can shut those sliders and then they can't really hear us so much and we can't really hear them so much. But she started talking, kind of hollering a little bit. So I opened the slider, I'm like, what's going on? And she goes, I think that it would be neat to cut off your head and put it on his body and cut his head off and put it on your body. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a plan. You know, that's nice. Thank you for that uh, input. 
So I'm looking at Alvin and he's looking at me and we're cracking up because, I mean, we're safe. She's not going anywhere. She's not armed. We searched her and everything. She's, <laughs> she's just crazy. Well, she's seriously crazy. So we're, we're, then we kind of started paying a little more attention just, you know, because, you know, once somebody starts talking that kind of shit, then you're, you're more apt to be a little more suspicious of everything they're doing. So we just kind of paid a little more attention to her on the, on the rest of the way down, kind of, you know, realizing that she was seriously messed up. So we got on down to, to Colorado Springs without any further ado. Um, no more weird comments from her or anything. So we get her out of the car and we're walking her into the state hospital down there. We're walking down this long ass hallway. He's on one side of her, I'm on the other. We both got her by our arms and we're walking her down this hallway. And she turns to Alvin and she says, I think she's pretty. I think I'd like to go out with her. <laughs> and Alvin, he just starts cracking up. And it was hard to crack up Alvin, but he was like, I could tell he was cracking up. So he's trying to maintain his facade, and I'm acting like I didn't hear it. We're just, I'm like, let's just get her in here and get rid of her. So we get her on into the desk, and we hand her over, and they have to get her in, booked in and everything, or, or processed before we can get our, because we had leg irons on her and, and you know, all the, all the traveling gear. So we had to get our manacles and all that back and our leg irons. So they got her all undone, we got her all undone and turned, them over to, turned her over to him. So we're on the way back out and Alvin starts laughing. I start laughing. I'm like, oh my God, what a day. <laughs> He's like, well, look on the bright side. He's like, all the fucking crazy people think you're sexy. <laughs> I was like, shut up. I never want to talk to you again. So we were just cracking up. It was just it was too funny. It was just bizarre. It was hilarious, but it was bizarre. So we went. <laughs> So we we ended up one of the reasons that we took those jobs, those extra jobs, is we got paid overtime to do it, but we also got to eat out at a good restaurant. On the on the city's nickel, so I mean, as by good, I don't mean like a you know hundred dollar plate place, but we got to go to Outback Steakhouse or something, whatever the town had that we were going to. So we did. We went to some steakhouse or something and had supper. So <laughs> it was great. That was the craziest day I ever had at work as far as dealing with crazy people, and I'm sure Alvin probably remembers that too because he was laughing at me the whole day, and I was just like, shut up. Just quit laughing. It's not that funny. He's like, oh, it's funnier than that funny. <laughs> like, shut up. You know, it's was, it was funny. But one of the things about being a cop, like, especially on a small department like that where you know everybody and you've worked, you know, rotations with everybody and stuff, is you get to be um, kind of like siblings, you know. It's, it's, more than just co-workers and it's more than just friends you get to be friends and you are co-workers obviously but you get to be almost like siblings where you're just goading each other see if you can get your you know get get their goat and just having fun because you know you spend so much time together and you start figuring out what annoys people and you can kind of needle them with that a little bit <laughs> Just like I do with my brothers, you know, just like I do with my sisters, things like that. So it, it's, it, that was fun. That was actually kind of a fun day, but it was also kind of a creepy day because all the crazy people were after me. So he wasn't wrong, but it was gross. <laughs> it was gross. So between a, a feces smear and crazy guy with a bow and arrow, to a crazy woman who wanted to switch our heads around, cut them off and switch them around, that's, that's how that went. So this is like cool barn country. Look at this neat one on the left. And then we got a round barn up here on the right. So this is all new territory for me. I do not remember ever coming up this far on 81 before. I got a guy back here who's itching to pass me and I'm running the speed limit. So go on, dude. I'm not in a hurry. So isn't that cool? It's a round barn. Very neat got a big ramp going up to it. looks like garage up on the second floor there maybe huh interesting 
interesting salt fork river there's a lot of water in the salt fork river well not a lot a lot of quite a lot of we're still in Oklahoma we have not crossed into Kansas yet but this is all new new territory to me I think anyway if I've been down this road I don't remember it put it that way and we're still on highway 81 we crossed over we kind of combined up with highway 60 back there where we made the right hand turn and then turned north again well 60 went on out east and 81 continues north We are in far northern Oklahoma right now. And that big cloud of smoke back there looked like a, a controlled burn out on a farm. <coughs> I could see some flames, but it was a small area, so I'm pretty sure it was probably a controlled burn. People do that all spring long, farmers do. They get all the crud together that, you know, busted limbs and dead trees and whatever. They pile them up in one spot on their property and then they burn it all on a calm day. And today's a good day for it because there's not much wind. So it's a excellent, it's cool and it's not windy, so it's an excellent day for control burn. So I'm just a little concerned. Bill has not called me yet. I've been gone two and a half hours, three almost three hours. We'll see, 11, 30, 12, 30, 1, 30. I've been gone three hours and he hasn't called me yet. It's either he's not feeling well today and he's sleeping. Or he's busy doing something today. Or he's not feeling good and he's sleeping. So we'll see. I guess when he calls me, I'll find out. I, I don't call him because if he's needing a nap and he needs to sleep um, I don't want to wake him up but I'll call him if I know he's up or if I have reasonable reasonable idea that he's up but uh, normally if, if it's something like this where I'm just not sure I just won't disturb him he'll call me when he's up and around I'm sure sure there was a bird sitting in a nest back in that tree. I just got a bare glimpse of it. I'll have to review that on the video if I can see it. I may not even be able to see it. But that field's been burnt off. Over to the right of us. Whether by design or not, it's been burned off. I've been tempted to burn our place, to burn the, the vegetation off of parts of it, but I don't want to burn our trees. We've got a lot of trees, so we've got a lot of stuff that it probably wouldn't hurt to burn it off once let everything come back fresh but I don't know a little risky too okay so we are getting close to the Oklahoma Kansas border I would not be surprised to find a casino up here at the border <laughs> 
that seems to be getting to be a thing at some of these some of these borders. It's like a refinery. Didn't realize this was up here. I must not have ever been up this road because none of this is looking familiar to me at all. So I'm going to say this is my first trip clear up on this part of 81. Which is bizarre to me because I've been running up and down 81 for years. got to be a refinery <clears throat> all those big old machine gadget thingies I would say strip over to the left of us and this is some kind of a town up here can't tell you Medford maybe it's like that's what the water tower says Medford yep Medford okay so I guess that's where we're at Medford Oklahoma got another Air Force plane out in front of this, whatever that is. That's the airport, I guess. Golf course slash airport road, I would say. Now this is only three hours north of where I live, but they get a lot colder temperatures up here. And they're about a week behind us, or a week and a half maybe, on leaves on their trees. You can see there's nothing, no leaves popping out up here yet. But they, they get a lot colder here than we get down in southern Oklahoma. And they stay colder longer. So... got a downtown area over to the left. We're going to stay on the highway and go on through. The Thirsty Buffalo. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Good name for a bar. It's 
looks like they got a courthouse. Shares of vehicles. Oh, they got a motel here. Look at that. Little mom and pop. And they've got what I need. A little quick stop. Their fuel's high, but I can go in and make my little pit stop anyway. I won't buy fuel here. I'm still over half a tank. I've still got five-eighths of a tank. So I don't need to worry about it yet. What I do need to worry about is getting a parking spot up by the store here. And probably buying something in there if I'm going to go in. much needed stop. <laughs> In other words, I really had to pee. Get me mic'd back up here. Oh. Medford. It's really nice to have a microphone with a long cord. I need to check that cord and make sure it's not doing anything funky. Try and get things readjusted here a little bit. Okay. I think we are ready. God, I can't believe these people out wearing shorts. I saw some of them yesterday, too. I'm like, it's 40 degrees out there. I'm getting old. <laughs> I think that's one of the signs of getting old. Is you're wearing, you know, three layers and a and a polar vest, and other people are out in sweatshirts and shorts. <laughs> like, okay. Alrighty then. I just get too cold. I just freeze anymore. I'm sure it's got everything to do with my metabolism. So, I'm just convinced of it. Flash flood possible next 14 miles. Do not drive into water. Okay, I will not drive into water. And I will be careful, and I will keep an eye out. But I think I'm good today because it's clear blue skies and no rain for days. But just to be on the safe side, I will be careful. I will watch. I didn't 
miss anything here. south into Bowie, Texas, it's two lane. Big wind farm up here. Blades are turning now. It's kind of odd because there wasn't much wind. 20 minutes ago, so maybe the wind's picking up a little. I don't know about these wind farms. I, I hate them, but I've learned to make peace with them because I can see the one near us out my kitchen window at night. I see the red blinking lights over the hill. <laughs> so I had to come to some kind of peaceful feeling about it because I couldn't, I didn't want to be mad every time I looked out my kitchen window. But I think they're a bunch of bullshit, to be perfectly honest. They're terrible at looking out in the environment. It's it's weird. I mean, these, these woke people and the uh, globalists want us to give up all of our good, cheap energy, which we have in abundance and go over to stuff that's not anywhere near as good and it's a lot more expensive. They just want us to do that because they think we're destroying the earth by using it. And what they don't seem to realize, or they do realize and they don't care because it doesn't fit their narrative, is that other countries don't have the rules we have. They don't follow any rules. Do you think China follows anybody's rules on anything? You're fucking crazy if you do. They do what they want to do, what's best for them, and that's what we should be doing too. If we had actual um, representatives and a decent leader in this country, we would be doing what would be good for us and then, you know, treating the rest of the world accordingly. 
but that's not how it is. Now we have to kiss everybody's ass and act like we're we're not as good as them because we're white and we're American and we're all supposed to be sorry for all this. And <laughs> the world has gone fucking insane. Fucking insane. Sorry, Wes, for the cussing. But I can't think of another stressor type of word to emphasize how fucking insane the world is today. It's just nuts. And it's not innocently, organically, accidentally nuts. It's nuts by fucking design, by the design of evil people who hate us and would like nothing better than to see the United States destroyed and all of us under subjugation and then they would come in and take all of our natural resources. That's what this is all about. The globalists want everything here that's worth something and they want to kill us all off because in our minds we're not worth anything to them. So, I mean, 20 years ago I started listening to people talk about this and I thought these people are crazy. You know, globalism, blah, 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 whatever. It sounds like wackadoodle shit. Doesn't sound so crazy anymore, does it? Because we're seeing it happen in front of our eyes. So, yeah. So when I see it, when these wind farms, I'm kind of like, all right, Sue. <laughs> Don't go off the rails here and think about all the other stupid shit associated with them. Just try and shine it on a little bit because there's nothing I can do to change the view out my kitchen window right now. You know, and I don't want to leave it because I like the location my kitchen window's in. You know, but there's going to come a day when people in this country have had enough and they're going to say, that's it. We've just had enough. You're going to stop this shit, and you're going to stop it now. And that's when it'll stop. Then, and only then, will it all stop. And as long as we all go along with it and say, oh, you know, that's okay. Yeah, we can, we can live with that. As long as we do that, they're going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing for more. Because they don't want us to just go along with this or that. Whatever their thing is, whether it's the... Um, environment or it's this trans liberalism that's going on or whatever their woke cause is that us agreeing with it or tolerating it is not enough we have to participate in it and we have to apologize for it and we have to atone for it and then we have to pay reparations for it that's what these people want and then they'll kill us all off and then they'll be done with us and the globalists will just have, you know, a certain amount of people left who will produce what they need, but we won't be all of us useless eaters, as that Claus guy, the creepy Claus guy from Germany, calls us useless eaters um, because he thinks that we're useless and we eat and that's all we do. We don't, you know, create or provide anything he wants. So. He, he would like nothing better than to see, you know, like 80% of the human population killed off. And, you know, you can, you can go down this rabbit hole and it'll take you to vaccines and diseases and COVID and all this other stuff, but it's all tied together. None of this is accidental. It's all by design. So... <laughs> I think, honestly, I think the only thing that saved us as long as it did was Donald Trump getting into the presidency when he did because that kept Hillary out and she wasn't able to fully implement the end game, which I think that was her job, was to implement the end game and to turn America over to the globalists. I think that was her part of the, the deal that she was supposed to get to do. And I think the only thing that stood between us and that was Donald Trump. So they're talking about arresting him next week, I guess. Which, it's going to be interesting how that shakes down. I don't know if that's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Maybe. 
at some point there's going to be a line that the government is going to cross that's going to be a bridge too far and it's going to break that camel's back and that camel's going to turn around and bite the shit out of the government and I'm not sure what form that biting is going to take whether it's going to be um, peaceful I hope it will be I hope that there will be no need for anything violent but I have my doubts about that because the left is violent inherently if you don't believe it look back at all the, the so-called peaceful protests they did back in uh, 2020 where they were burning down cities and destroying property and killing people you know they they want to talk about an insurrection at the at the White House but what they put this country through um, went on for months and was infinitely more damaging and infinitely worse and destroyed a lot of people's belief or faith that our government has any control over anybody or any any um, sanity any sane people in there running the, the program you know it's like the the lunatics have taken over the asylum so I don't know it's going to be interesting it's going to be very very interesting you know, I, I'm picturing in my mind that this DA in New York City actually does get to arrest Donald Trump and he's going to do this big perp walk and all the ABCs, NBCs, CNNs, all the alphabet soup of mainstream media that have been out to get Trump from the very beginning um, and would love nothing more than to be able to show him in handcuffs. Um, I'm sure they'll all be there. But what's that going to do? What message is that going to send to everybody um, that's not woke, that's not a liberal? I mean, that's going to send a terrible message. And the message that I take away from it is that our government has been hijacked by radical leftist activists. And it's out of control. And we need to send somebody in there to stop this takeover of our government by the by the radical nuts so I don't know that's my takeaway my opinion and I'm fucking entitled to it so <laughs> you know, as you are to yours and I'll fight for your right to be able to express your opinion even if I disagree with it a hundred percent by the way I'm not one of these people that thinks that you know, the, the view, as hideous of a TV show as that is, and as stupid as those women can be, I'm not one of the people calling for the view to be taken off the air because they have the right to express their stupid-ass opinions. They have every right to do that, and I don't care. I don't watch it. So the only way I know about the really stupid things they say is when other people complain about them. <laughs> because I've never actually watched that show. I think I maybe have tried to watch it once back when Barbara Walters first started it and I thought it was eh, boring. So I just never really got into it. But it's the same thing with, you know, same thing with them expressing their opinion on TV in my mind as it is with me expressing my opinion here or on the street or whatever. In, in the United States we have the right to freedom of speech. Okay, we are entering Kansas. And I'm going to make a note. And I'm also going to pull over and get this guy off my ass. He's been up my ass for miles and he won't go around me. I don't like tailgaters. I really seriously don't like tailgaters. So anyway, I'm, I'm a big proponent of freedom of speech, even when it's speech that may piss me off, because, you know, um, just because I don't agree with what any of these people that I consider to be wackadoodle leftists, 
even though I don't agree with anything they say, <laughs> and I hate the things they say, I will fight to the death to defend their right to say them. Because that is the crux of freedom of speech. And if they're not willing, in return, to fight to the death to protect my right to express my opinion, then they're phony. They're fake. And they have no ethics. They're unethical bastards. You know, because that is the bedrock of our American society is freedom of speech. It's also a free press, too. We don't have a free press anymore. Well, let me put it this way. We don't have a free uh, mainstream press anymore. They are owned lock, stock, and barrel by the leftists and the globalists. <clears throat> we do, however, have something even better coming up because of the way um, these crazy media people have, have been so slanted in their reporting and so biased. We've got a whole new generation of independent reporters, independent journalists, who are actually doing the, the research and doing good um, investigative reporting as well as political reporting. So you just have to look for them because they're, you're not going to find them on uh, the main alphabet TV stations because they're all owned by, you know, leftists. So <clears throat> you just have to hunt for the people that are actually doing the, the research and the, the journalism. You know, there, there are some really good ones out there right now. So this is Caldwell, Kansas. I'm pretty sure I've been to Caldwell before. So I may have been up this road once a long, long, long time ago and just didn't really remember it. <laughs> nice big old houses in these towns. Somebody here at one time had some money. Yeah, they probably had good businesses and lots of kids, big old houses to raise them in. Caldwell Historic Cowtown District. And this was also a stop on the uh, Chisholm Trail, I'm sure. So we're running right up the Chisholm Trail, basically. I don't know where we part ways with it or where it ends because it had to go somewhere to um, a railhead. That was the whole point of driving the cattle up through here was to get them to the railroad. So they could send them back east and get money for them, you know. So it's a neat looking little town. We have a similar building to this one on the right in Marlow, made of a similar cut stone, similar design. So that was evidently pretty popular hope that was running. Probably pretty popular around the turn of the last century. 